Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to wish you a wonderful evening. Welcome to the Diplomatic Academy, to our event for tonight, to everyone who has made their way to join us personally, but also to all our viewers who are joining us online. My name is Michael Zinkanel. I'm the director of the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you all tonight to this event that we're organizing together with the Diplomatic Academy, but also uh, with the Vienna International Institute for Economics, the new BRICS Plus, Geostrategic and Geoeconomic Consequences for World Order. And I would like to start my very brief introduction in my role as a moderator before introducing our two excellent speakers today with a quote. The quote goes as the following, the BRICS formation is not a geopolitical alliance, but rather a platform for dialogue and cooperation among equals. It aims to promote mutual understanding, peace and development. That was a quote from the former Russian president, Dmitry Medvedev, uh, in 2010 at the second summit of the BRICS in Brazil. And I chose that quote deliberately in order to show you how much the world has changed on the one side ever since that quote 13 years ago, but also how much the BRICS format has changed in that time and the role the BRICS countries are playing in the international environment today. Um, 2010 was, by the way, the time when South Africa just joined the BRICS and now we have a new international environment. 13 years later, where geopolitical and geoeconomic, the situation has shifted dramatically, geoeconomic and geopolitical challenges, but also uh, competition and grievances have certainly grown tremendously. And we can also see and analyze a new manifestation of global authoritarian, authoritarianism where the new BRICS countries, the old and the new BRICS countries, are certainly playing their role in today's world. And we will discuss these questions, especially the role of the BRICS, its expansion, the new member states that have been confirmed to join at the beginning of next year, Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates, certainly countries uh, in regions that are of geostrategic, geopolitical, and also geoeconomic geo importance. And therefore, I would like to welcome two distinguished experts in the field of geoeconomics and geopolitics who, due to their expertise, to their internationally recognized and certainly appreciated uh, expertise, probably don't need a very long introduction because we do know both of them quite well. On my right, I can welcome Dr. Werner Fasselabend, the president of the AIS and former Minister of Defense. And on my left, we have with us Mario Horzner, economist and since 2019, the executive director of the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies. Thank you both very much for being with us today. We will start with two short presentations, including a couple of maps and slides and some facts and figures by both Mr. Fasselamt and Mr. Hartzner before we will then also engage in an interactive discussion with you, with the audience tonight. And therefore, without any further ado, I'd like to ask you, Werner Fasselamt, to give us your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, also a, a warm welcome from my side. It's a pleasure that you found a way, even if it is raining outside and not so comfortable. But I guess uh, the issue should be interesting enough because maybe it will be quite a factor in the future. Yeah, let me try to uh, just say a few words, you know. The term BRICS is not so old. Uh, for the first time it was used by an economist from Goldman Sachs 
Jim O'Neill, who just wanted uh, more or less to characterize a few countries with the highest potential for growth. This was the beginning, and he named four countries, China, Russia, uh, India, and Brazil. And as it was mentioned already, this was in, uh, in 2001. And of course, for the first years, uh, this notion, this term was used quite frequently in many papers. It was not only the BRICS, but also the so-called next 11s uh, that should matter for the future. Uh, and, well, uh, it took round about five years until uh, a structure was shaped out of it. 2006, for the first time, the foreign ministers uh, met. 2009, the first summit. Then, in 2010, it became uh, enlarged with South Africa. Uh, and now, there is the major step of six new members. But before we go into the details, maybe I just would like also to compare it with other institutions. Because what is the BRICS? The BRICS is, or used to be at least, an assembly of uh, countries, a group of countries, of uh, emerging countries. But we also do have two other institutions. On the one hand, G7, and at the other hand, also G20, which do operate in a similar field. Just let me uh, show the picture. I try to do it in the right way. Yeah, this is just you know an overview about the three organizations. G7, founded 1975, and it has uh, the seven, let me say, Western advanced economies. For quite some time, one and a half decade, also Russia did belong to this group as the G8, but after the start of the war in Ukraine, uh, Russia was excluded. And just uh, uh, before BRICS was founded, also G20 was founded, and this was quite interesting because if you look to this group of countries, you can see uh, around half of it are advanced economies and half of it are emerging economies. And it was founded by the Americans more or less as a new forum uh, for global leadership. UN did not fit uh, as such an organization. And this was a new group, of course, very informal, just as the G7 or G8. Uh, and uh, it became certainly a factor that still is alive. BRICS, uh, at the beginning, was only the group consisting out of this, let me say, five countries. All of them were at the same time also members of G7, uh, of G20. Insofar, it was an additional uh, group that really concentrated on emerging economies and not just generally. Now we have six more members, Saudi Arabia, Iran, United Arab uh, Emirates, Egypt, Ethiopia, and Argentina. And this is quite interesting because uh, it certainly will change the structure quite a bit. Not all of them used to be also members of G20, and insofar it certainly has changed. Let me go further on. Uh, you probably have seen in different medias this uh, presentation of, okay, what does it mean, BRICS expansion, uh, GDP, population, oil production, exports of goods, and you can see, okay, in most cases, uh, the expansion is not that high. Not for GDP, uh, not so much population uh, in exports of goods, but there is a significant increase also uh, in oil production. 
let me go further on, and therefore, uh, if we just try now uh, to become or to have a look at the geostrategy of this expansion, the geostrategy that is behind more or less, uh, that you can see the following thing. The orange colored countries are the original five countries, uh, the yellow countries are the new countries. And I think uh, it is also the first look, also, uh, first view also shows clearly, you know, there's one additional member in South America, and there are three uh, new members, or uh, three members altogether now uh, in Africa, two new members, but on the whole, it is five new members in the MENA region. So far, there certainly is a concentration, and this concentration probably uh, will go on in the future because it's not certain yet whether Argentine really should become a member. The government welcomed it, but the opposition is against it. They will have elections uh, the 22nd uh, of October this year. Also the new coming president probably is uh, in opposition to a membership and insofar it easily could be that it only will be an enlargement of five uh, members. Interesting, I mean, if you look now to this structure is that only two of the four members, namely uh, Saudi Arabia and Argentine, are already members of G20 at the same time, but four countries do not belong to any other forum uh, in economic coordination and cooperation uh, that has a worldwide uh, importance. This is Iran, Egypt, the Emirates, and Ethiopia. And if, you, if we ask ourselves uh, why did it come, because uh, there, is, there was quite an interest. This is just uh, the picture of, you know, the countries interested to become members. I do not go into details. It's uh, quite a number of countries interested to become members. Why were just those six countries selected? And if we look at it once again from a geostrategic perspective, you can see the following thing. Uh, it's quite interesting. You have on the one hand, now, uh, this is a map with all the G20 members. The uh, gray countries are not members. The green country, uh, the gr gr uh, green colored countries uh, are not members as countries, but just African Union for, uh, as a whole uh, is a member of the G20, and insofar, uh, they do belong to it. But now, uh, if you look who was overtaken from the G20, because all the original members used to be members of G20, you can see, okay, not the North Atlantic countries, and not the Western Pacific countries. Of course, uh, uh, I mean, if you look a little bit closer, it's quite interesting. You could say, okay, uh, Mexico is certainly emerging, but it is already more or less together with United States and Canada in one group. On the other hand, also uh, for Turkey, the same thing. It's a member uh, of NATO, therefore there's a reason. Really interesting is that in the Western Pacific, uh, one state that is at the same time the fourth biggest nation of the world namely Indonesia, did not become uh, invited to become a member uh, of BRICS Plus, although it clearly is an emerging country and not uh, an advanced economic country. And therefore, you also can see that the decision obviously uh, did not follow uh, primarily economic uh, interests, but political interests. If we go further on, uh, it might be quite interesting. I 
go back once again, you know, this map I drew already around about 10 years ago, even more of that. This was China's global strategy, and you could see, you know, uh, that the gray countries, this is North America, uh, Europe, and the Western Pacific countries, Japan, South Korea, uh, Australia, did not belong to this uh, uh, global strategy of China, at least in the first run, and the orange countries uh, were countries that maybe could keep outside uh, of Chinese influence, Russia due to its size, uh, India and also South uh, and uh, also Saudi Arabia due to its economic size. If I go back once again in order to show it, just look at the map, what is excluded, and now look once again at China's global strategy. You can see uh, this parallel uh, formation of countries, and insofar uh, you can see this is certainly a big hint also uh, that there is, there is a political will behind it. Uh, yeah, now let's go to the next picture. The resources potential that was already spoken out. Of course, this will change uh, or bring quite some changes because three out of the four biggest oil producers now do belong to the BRICS. And in addition to that, uh, this is Russia, uh, Saudi Arabia, and Iran. And in addition to that, uh, also the Emirates will come. And insofar, this certainly does, uh, does, uh, will be quite an important factor. And of course, it does fit, fit on the one side also to the position of the two leading figures of the BRICS. This is on the one side Xi Jinping and on the other, at the other side uh, Putin. Xi Jinping said economic security is the foundation practically for everything. And therefore you can see that the Chinese strategy and this uh, economic strategy go quite parallel. On the other hand, Putin's uh, very important statement uh, also in the last months or the last two years was uh, that there should be no cheap energy and no cheap resources anymore for the West. This uh, you can see here, of course, uh, both interests fit together and certainly uh, used to be sort of a basis also for those invitations. Because if you take it uh, more or less politically, you could say it's almost an OPEC, a small OPEC plus uh, now together with China and also India, the most important uh, countries for energy demand. If we look now to another dimension, uh, the global maritime traffic dimension, then you can see uh, there is more or less a concentration of the maritime uh, cargo traffic. And you have to be aware that around about 90% of uh, international trade go by maritime cargo traffic, 90%. And you can see this concentration, I do not know whether, uh, you can see this light concentration in Europe, then this line going uh, around the Atlantic coast, through the Mediterranean, through the Red Sea, uh, across the Indian Ocean, and then uh, the Western Pacific uh, border of the ocean. And of course, there's another line that goes down uh, to the Cape of Good Hope in the south of Africa, and then it's spreading uh, to South America. And if we go now to the next picture, and uh, we look at what is the effect of the new members, then you can see the following. First of all, you have this 
direct line from the Mediterranean into the Indian Ocean, going through the Suez Canal, the Red Sea, and Bab el Mandab. Major line of interest, not only for China, but also for Europe, of course, uh, more or less one of the most important uh, sea routes uh, one can imagine. Next to it, you also can see, you know, the Gulf with the Strait of Hormuz, another uh, highly important strait, uh, not only for trade, but especially also for the energy sector. Then the BRICS with uh, South Africa also are more or less in control of the Cape of Good Hope. And insofar from European side or from uh, the Atlantic side, you could say uh, that the two most important ways from between Europe and Asia, the sea, uh, ways on the seas, uh, that they are in the future under control of countries uh, of, uh, that belong to the BRICS. At the same time, you also could see, okay, uh, maybe in the north uh, with climate change and, and uh, maybe uh, offering new opportunities also for sea trade uh, in the northeast passage. Uh, this is an additional way that would be under control of the BRICS and also South America would be uh, the Atlantic side of South America would be under control of the BRICS. And insofar you can see, uh, if you look at this uh, enlargement by a purely geostrategic question, there is not only uh, the question of, uh, I don't know, interesting countries, economically countries, but of course also there is quite some geostrategy behind it. Of course, now you can say this is long away. Uh, when the G, uh, uh, when the BRICS really will be able to control uh, those ways. For the next 10 years, you can forget it. But if you want to think geostrategically, this never will be a question of the next five or 10 years, but questions of the long run. And uh, this is what we have uh, to learn. Yeah, and you also could say m probably the same thing happens uh, with cybersecurity, undersea cables. Just look at this ways in Europe going through the Mediterranean, uh, Suez Canal, uh, Red Sea, and so versa, uh, towards India and then towards uh, China, Japan, uh, and Korea, and so on. Okay. Now, uh, let's go to a point that uh, Mario Holzner uh, will talk about from the economic side. I just want uh, to list it. This is a question that came up with the enlargement, the question of de-dollarization. What is meant by this? this uh, the meaning is the interest of some countries to have uh, more trade in the future in their own national currency and not so much uh, in dollars. Of course, this has two sides. On the one side, this will lower the dependency uh, on, on the dollar. Uh, on the other side, of course, this also uh, will uh, weaken the dollar because the strength of the dollar certainly is next to the military capability of America, the most important factor for world dominance. And insofar, uh, this certainly will be important. This is just, uh, I mean, a picture that Russia is already on the way, you know, uh, not to have uh, any trade uh, in dollars. China, of course, is highly interested. There's also quite some interest maybe uh, in India to have more trade in rupees. But the decisive question certainly will be what 
Saudi Arabia will do in the future due to the petrodollars, uh, which are decisive, that the dollar really has its function as uh, a global currency. Next picture shows us uh, the next picture shows us uh, a dimension that usually is not included in geostrategic thinking. This is the cultural and the value-based political dimension. And if you look now to this uh, enlargement, you can see that you have the three leading Arab countries. Saudi Arabia as the richest one, and as the home of Mecca and Medina, Egypt as the most populated country, and also with quite some intellectual capability due to uh, the al Asa University and Cairo University and so on, and the Emirates more or less uh, standing for glamour uh, and uh, modernization in the Arab world. Okay, but this is not everything, because this means that the leading Arab countries are invited to join the BRICS. At the same time also, uh, an opponent of the Arab world, Iran, uh, has been invited. And this means that the whole Islamic world, not only Sunni, but the Shia, also the Shia dimension, is invited uh, to become a member uh, of the BRICS. And of course, values, culture, does play a role, and the question whether the Arab world, whether the Islamic world, will be closer to the West or to the East, maybe will be a decisive factor for the future. Uh, next picture, very shortly, no, there's not. Uh, the, the BRICS only have one structural institution they can control. Uh, G20 doesn't have any one, but of course, G20 can more or less by the leadership uh, of the advanced economies control the monetary fund uh, and the World Bank. And this institution uh, for the BRICS is or has been or will be the new development bank. Uh, in this new development bank, Egypt and the Emirates used to be already members. In the future, there will be the question whether Saudi Arabia will join it because this will be the decisive factor for investment uh, capability. Now, let's look uh, more or less what are the achievements and the challenges for the BRICS. The achievements certainly are, on the one hand, uh, in, the in the fact that this new constellation brings uh, states and brings f countries at the same table, uh, countries with an antagonistic background. And what you can see here is that you have on the one side, you know, certainly most important for the new members is that now Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, two enemies, classical enemies, you could say, uh, will sit at the same table. And in addition to that, also Egypt and Ethiopia that have quite some differences due to uh, the question of uh, the new huge dam uh, in, in Ethiopia, they also will sit at the same table. And if you look further on, you can see also, I mean, already in the past, between China and Russia, it was not uh, always only harmony, but of course there were also open questions. And sitting on the same table, being in a small group, of course also brings uh, the advantage of discussing uh, things. The big question and the most important question out of it certainly will be uh, the relationship between China uh, and India because this certainly is not only antagonistic but 
I would say, even goes beyond. The reason for this is, of course, uh, yeah, this maritime lifelines. Uh, as you can see at this uh, map, China is not only bordering uh, India from the north, uh, but it also has established two corridors, the Pakistan cor corridor and the Myanmar corridor, and they even go into the sea because there's not only uh, this lifeline for uh, East Asia, on the other side also for the Europeans, of course, uh, that also goes to Sri Lanka and the Maldives. And insofar, uh, strategically, you know, these initiatives from the Chinese side bring more or less an encirclement uh, of India. And therefore, the antagonist situation between China and India will not lower, but rather become stronger. Uh, this is also the reason that in security questions, they are not uh, the center of dialogues uh, between the BRICS group, but India joins the so-called Quad, the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, together with Japan, America, and Australia, and this means with Western nations. And insofar, uh, of course, it is a split situation, but on the other hand, of course, it is also uh, a situation where Russia used to be and also will be in the future a partner for India, uh, a strong partner due to the strategic situation in Asia and versus uh, China, and therefore just maybe to keep it more or less neutral or whatever uh, is of course an important question in power politics. Now we come uh, slowly but surely to the end. Uh, what I wanted to show you no, uh, is, okay, geostrategy is not only a question of territories and uh, waters and straits and so on, but also of persons. And what certainly is impressive, if you look now, you know, uh, to the leadership of the BRICS countries. You have with Lula in Brazil, Putin, Xi Jinping, uh, Saudi Crown Prince, MBZ from the Emirates, uh, and Narendra Modi from India, certainly uh, a group of extremely dynamic people. Strong and dynamic. I mean, at least uh, if you compare it with the Western leaders, <laughs> uh, Macron, Scholz, Biden, uh, Sunak, and uh, Kishida. So far you have to say, okay, one should not, the lesson is, do not underestimate the banks, because personal dynamics probably are on their side. And it will be the question whether Western countries can compensate it by advantages out of the system, uh, but they only will be able to do it uh, if, if uh, yeah, they can realize not only ideas, but certain projects. Coming to the end, I have to say, what certainly will be the outcome of uh, the enlargement of the BRICS will be the competition in the three main regions of strategic comp uh, competition between the Western world and China, or let me say, the BRICS group. And this will be West Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. In Southeast Asia, we have it already. Now, uh, there is the new link between China, the BRICS, uh, Russia, and uh, Saudi Arabia. Certainly quite a difference uh, if you compare it with the situation a few years ago. This was purely Western, of course. Now this means competition. And in the center, of course, uh, there is India as the decisive factor. What can we learn out of it is uh, as an overall lesson. Certainly, the importance of the Indo-Pacific 
will increase. This is the picture that shows, you know, the maritime center of the world. For everybody who has not seen it yet, in uh, the ancient world, this used to be the Mediterranean. Uh, with the discovery of America, this changed. The Mediterranean lost its importance, and the northern uh, Atlantic became more or less the center of global uh, gravity. And in the, with the beginning of the 21st century, this is the Indo-Pacific area. For the first time, it's also the area where Europe is not an immediate neighbor, and Europe will have to do everything not to be out of business. Okay, therefore, the lesson for us is we will have to try to look beyond our own plate and to occupy, to open our eyes and try to be an actor worldwide, not just in our immediate neighborhood, but beyond. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Werner Fasslabend, for your excellent remarks and especially presenting the political and geostrategic challenges that await us. We'll now move from the more political uh, analysis to the economic side. We have briefly mentioned it already in the first presentation that there are some crucial overlaps and I'd like to welcome you, Mario Horzner, now to the stage for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so Werner Fasslappen has basically uh, touched upon all the important issues already. Uh, what remains for me to do is uh, to maybe highlight a few of those things, underscore them, and, and add maybe a few additional um, figures, uh, statistics, uh, on, on the maybe more economic perspective. Well, we will see it's very difficult to actually disentangle these spheres. Uh, uh, and um, hence, uh, let me start with, uh, again, also comparing a little bit um, the importance of um, the BRICS uh, uh, and uh, compared to the G7 uh, and, and the rest of the world. Uh, we have here uh, a few major indicators. On the left-hand side, in, in terms of population, clearly uh, with the two heavyweights, China and India, uh, the BRICS here in blue, uh, they cover about 40% of the, of the world's population. And compared to that, the G7 are really uh, minuscule, uh, around 10% uh, of the population of, of the planet. Um, however, if we look in a way at a measure of uh, economic um, uh, uh, wealth and, and, and activity, better to say, uh, uh, gross domestic product, one of the measures uh, of, of economic activity, in this case at purchasing power parity, so it was tried to equalize price differences, uh, we see that the BRICS do not necessarily dominate, and not yet at this point in time, the figures are from 21, uh, uh, the global sphere, it's approximately the same size, so around uh, a third of the global economic activity is in the BRICS and another third in the G7. However, and this is uh, a third dimension I want to show here, in terms of carbon footprint, there is a certain difference. Um, uh, this indicates that the way uh, uh, the production in the BRICS uh, happens is uh, including much more heavy industry uh, and other uh, activities with a lot of CO2 emissions. So we see that about half of the global CO2 emissions uh, are coming from the BRICS countries and uh, the G7 have reduced their uh, share uh, quite dramatically to, to let's say, uh, 20, to, to about a quarter of the uh, global CO2 emissions. Now, uh, we'll, uh, there will be two slides which you have already seen uh, today just to basically once again uh, indicate that extending the BRICS to the BRICS plus, which is the, the green countries which uh, uh, were invited to join the BRICS, uh, plus additionally potentially interested countries here in yellow, um, 
clearly in terms of 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 the of, of the surface of the of the world, um, uh, this this increases a lot in 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 terms of of space, um, and when we zoom into um, uh, these uh, indicators which add the green countries, so those who were invited, we see that actually in most cases there is not really a huge change. So in terms of GDP, these additional countries do not make a big difference. Um, in terms of population, it's also not that uh, uh, the situation changes dramatically. Um, also in terms of trade, this is, this is not really something um, new. However, there is this one difference, and that's resource abundance. So, uh, in addition to the oil producer, the heavyweight oil producer Russia, you would have also uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and the United Arab Emirates, which all together would come close to half of the global uh, oil production. Uh, so, that is obviously um, uh, uh, quite significant, and that's not the only thing. So. Another um, case in point uh, would be rare earths. If you uh, look at the right uh, infographic, um, you will uh, see the uh, places, uh, uh, the countries in the world where the uh, reserves of rare earths are. So this is China, uh, uh, this is Vietnam, India, uh, Brazil uh, and Russia. This is basically the most of, of, of the reserves are located in those countries. Although we know rare earths are not really rare, it's just the point whether you have the space to, to dig them out in a quite toxic way. And who is actually um, producing uh, uh, those rare earth metals on the left infographic? Uh, it's mostly China at the moment and a little bit uh, in the US as well. Uh, and uh, more generally maybe, uh, if we look at uh, uh, clean energy metals, so these are not only rare earth, um, these uh, include copper, nickel, um, cobalt, lithium, what have you. And in most of those cases, it's not even BRICS countries who are producing the raw material. But on the right hand side, you see where these metals are being processed. And that's uh, to a large extent in China. Uh, it's not even about the BRICS or the BRICS plus. China is really the country uh, that uh, controls the processing of global clean energy metals. And if we assume that uh, the energy transition by now is not anymore just something that the political sphere in, in, in saturated Western countries uh, has at some point in time started, but that basically the whole uh, business sector is in a process where um, the energy transition will come no matter uh, um, uh, what, what happens in the political sphere because uh, <laughs> basically also of price dynamics and, and, and the whole set of investment that has already started to push into that direction, um, then this obviously uh, is geoeconomically an issue. I would now like to uh, shift to overall uh, trade issues. Uh, I have a set of export f uh, maps um, and uh, this is the one uh, for China. Uh, China has a huge amount of annual exports um, in the tune of uh, about 3.4 trillion US dollars. Difficult to, uh, to imagine actually. It's basically the world's factory and there is in that sense mutual dependence. China wanted to actually increase domestic demand but they failed basically miserably in that and China is also dependent on the markets in in the rest of the world, almost everywhere, China is exporting really a lot of, um, uh, of its, uh, the goods it produces and also services, but mostly goods as we will see later on. And we have here the top three export destinations and China uh, uh, sends 17% of its exports to the United States of America. Uh, and then comes Hong Kong with 10% and Japan with 5% and uh, also quite a lot uh, to, to, to Germany, by the way. Um, if we look at India, uh, a different picture emerges, um, at least to a certain extent. India uh, is exporting only a tenth of what uh, China is exporting, yeah? so about uh, 300 to 400 billion US dollars. Um, so in that sense, at least compared to China, India is a really closed economy, uh, but it 
sells its exports even more so to the US. So 19% of India's exports go to the US and the next two uh, countries among the top three uh, export destinations are China actually and the Arab Emirates, uh, so both with about 6%. And if you look at uh, the U.S. Uh, in this context, where does the U.S. export to? Well, it actually exports also quite a lot. So the idea that uh, the U.S. is a completely deindustrialized country without any exports is simply not true. The U.S. is exporting about half of what China is exporting at the moment, 1.7, 1.8 trillion U.S. dollars. And uh, interestingly, most uh, heavily involved in uh, in trade in with its neighbors, so both about 15 to 16 percent with Canada and Mexico. But next uh, comes already top three uh, uh, export destination is China with about nine percent. So again, here you see a certain forms of, of interdependence and uh, probably certain difficulties to completely change uh, maybe uh, international trade uh, uh, denomination from U.S. dollar into. Uh, into uh, Remimbi. Um, let's zoom in into what these countries actually trade. What are their export uh, products? This reflects obviously the uh, overall economic structure in the background. So these are the uh, different shares of US exports and uh, what the biggest part of it is, is this dark red uh, left-hand part. These are services exports and among them most importantly ICT services. Um, and, uh, quite interestingly, this is very similar to India's export structure. It's also mostly services and among them even more so ICT services. So there are certain patterns of, um, of similarity between uh, US uh, and uh, India's uh, export structure with the related strong uh, impact on intra-industry trade. So it's uh, more often than not that interestingly, it is uh, industries and countries specialized in certain industries within the same industry that do a lot of, 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 of also communication and have uh, various forms of, of interaction. By contrast, China is a different animal in this respect. Um, uh, the, the heavy baiting Chinese uh, exports are electronics and you then have also machines with a lot of computers and, and, and these things but also across the board, uh, all kinds of other goods. So, huge amount of exports. China imports relatively less. So China is um, uh, a net exporter. Uh, in a way, it's a bigger Germany and uh, uh, both are, to a certain extent, unfortunately, but then again, maybe it makes sense, um, uh, actually proud of being uh, uh, export Weltmeister, export Kaiser or export König or what have you, completely misunderstanding that uh, a big nation that actually wants to have more influence in the world, such as the US or as uh, the um, as Great Britain used to be before the US, uh, these are actually countries with net imports altogether. Yeah? They are creating demand for the whole world. So these countries, um, China and Germany, are actually exporting indirectly unemployment uh, to the rest of the world. One could see it also from this point of view. Uh, now, what is China doing with these huge amounts of surplus, mostly US dollar, that it uh, gains on the world markets, well, it tries to invest it somewhere. Where can you invest in the world, for instance, private uh, uh, households or private firms? Well, they would go maybe to the global stock markets. Um, and uh, here we see uh, that most of the uh, global um, uh, stocks are actually in the US. If you look at market capitalization, shares, the blue bits of this uh, of this. Uh, global stock market is the US. Other forms of uh, investment, uh, the global bond market, well, basically the same picture. Again, the US is the place where you buy uh, uh, bonds being uh, from corporates being uh, sovereign bonds. Uh, and uh, this also should remind us that uh, debt is not something negative, it's, uh, it's being uh, seen in German language as a Schuld, almost a moral uh, issue, but it actually at the same time has the function of an asset. Uh, it is something 
that you invest to. That's the other side of the, the bond side. Uh, um, uh, so there's this lender-borrower relationship. And uh, it's also an investment. Yeah? And uh, uh, maybe, maybe uh, this is not really part of this story, but I like to, to mention it. Uh, there, there are these conflicting stories. On the one hand, also the European Commission wants that Europe becomes the most competitive countries, uh, uh, block basically, with also export surpluses. Uh, and at the same time, um, uh, they are wondering why isn't the euro more important in the world? Yeah? And uh, if you're not ready to, for instance, increase indebtedness uh, in, 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 in euro uh, by, for instance, uh, having uh, straight jackets in the fiscal regime or even not allowing for proper um, euro bonds, well, then nobody will buy these assets. Yeah? So uh, the difference is really that the US uh, also finances a lot of its public activities via selling basically uh, government bonds as safe assets. More or less safe assets because as we saw the Russians were quite surprised that their assets in US dollars were actually frozen. So this is something that obviously is an, an issue and uh, just as a third element uh, to show that the US dollar in, in the financial sphere is still the only game in town is uh, the, the share in the world's um, uh, uh, top reserve currencies, so what the central banks hold in terms of foreign currency, and again, uh, dollar is dominating even more than, than what we saw before. Uh, the euro is actually isn't doing that bad, yeah, but still 20% could be, could be more, I guess. Anyway, let me conclude at this point um, and, and maybe add a few uh, political observations, although I'm an economist, I should probably uh, uh, not, not talk too, too much about this dimension, but um, I would guess that the BRICS never really can be something politically important, uh, basically because also what was mentioned before, um, uh, the differences between India and, and China, and India probably would always ultimately prefer the US over China. This is not only related to the conflict in, in Kashmir, uh, but, uh, and other issues, um, but I think I could show you that also from the structure of, uh, uh, of the economy uh, there are quite some overlaps in, in, in the way the US and, and, and India work and uh, China has a bit of a different uh, position here. Um, in principle we saw China has a huge uh, amount of, uh, of, of, of goods it is trading all over the world so in principle moving away from a dollar denominated trade probably would be possible although if you if you continue there is always then someone else who will uh, have to uh, to deal with dollar because the, the demand from the US is very strong we saw this uh, in the trade patterns of both China and India uh, but what is much more difficult is to uh, get rid of the US dollar as a reserve currency uh, also unless China lifts its capital control. So you can't just um, uh, uh, run around with, with money in, in and out of China. There are issues also that China is using uh, financial market uh, elements in, in its uh, diplomacy uh, even more strongly than, than the US did. And uh, in a way, um, uh, uh, the expectations of people who invest in certain government bonds is that in case they need the money, they can uh, freely again uh, exit that, sell things, and 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 uh, and use uh, these funds. So uh, this is an issue. Um, and I would say, although in many ways we are now in a multipolar world, in terms of international finance, I think I was able to show you. I hope that the world is still basically uh, U.S. centric, uh, uh, monopolar. If oh, there is just one pole in that respect. Um, Therefore, I would say in geoeconomic terms, the BRICS are not that important. And uh, I think a BRICS currency, at least at, least at the moment, uh, that is challenging the dollar is still, is still a fantasy. Uh, and I would predict that geoeconomically, the, the, the century that we have here is one uh, of the US versus China. And the others will ultimately have to choose sides or at least try to navigate in between these two uh, countries and, and find some sort of, 
of, of way to, to survive with this uh, situation. And I would like to stop with, with an old joke. I don't know whether you, 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 you know that one. Um, there is this question, you know, what are the four reasons for the US dollar's global dominance? And the answer is basically the US Army, the US Air Force, the US Navy, and the US Marine Corps. Now, maybe it is not a joke, and in, with this I want to hand back uh, again um, to the people who do political uh, studies and international relations who know, I guess, much more than me about this issue. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maria Horstner, for drawing this very comprehensive economic picture for all, also going into the details and showing us how the uh, environment of exports is being uh, laid out in different countries, also BRICS countries versus especially the US. Um, we have come to a point where I would like also to invite the audience to engage in a couple of questions, but before that I'd like to just quickly ask uh, one or two questions to our speakers myself. We have heard in particular about the shift in global power, the BRICS becoming more dominant, um, also the question of a decreased importance, especially for the G7. We have heard also the increasing dependencies when it comes to rare earth metals and rare materials, not only in terms of where they're located right now and where they're being excavated, but also where they're being processed for future clean energy. We've heard about challenges, especially in the bilateral relations, that can also pose potential threats for the BRICS in the future, especially between India and China, but also between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And also we have touched upon the demographic developments globally that are also turning towards a shift towards BRICS countries and also their uh, future countries that are going to join BRICS soon. So from that perspective, keeping all the aspects in mind that we have discussed, I have one concrete question, first of all, for Werner Fasleabend. Um, due to the fact that not only here, our audience in this room, but also the United States, the EU, the political stakeholders in uh, both these countries and regions are aware of these developments. How would you describe the reaction that could be possible from the EU, but especially also from the US, towards this growing importance of the BRICS plus in the international scene? Now, I would say uh, we have already the first step experienced. You know, there was just a few weeks ago when there was the G20 summit uh, in <coughs> Delhi, uh, India as uh, in the presidency, and you could see, you know, that uh, Americans and the Europeans presented uh, sort of a new uh, Western uh, Silk Road or whatever they named it, the Western Silk Road, is a notion uh, Maria Holst <laughs> presented already two years ago, but initiatives from the American side. And not only initiatives, but it was very interesting to see uh, that how much they included Saudi Arabia into this program. And so far you really can see, you know, uh, after this period of very close relationship between America and so Saudi Arabia, uh, that broke uh, with the case of Kasogi, Kasogi uh, and, and Biden's attitude afterwards uh, to, to uh, the Saudi crown prince, you know. Obviously, uh, they realize that the reaction, uh, that, that there will be a, a reaction and the reaction will not be positive uh, for America and the West, and therefore I have the impression that they try now very hard uh, to compensate, to go, to bring it back uh, closely. And this is what I meant also with this, you know, competition. Mm -hmm. We do have now competition uh, in the Arab world. Uh, 
uh, especially on the Arab Peninsula. We do have it already in Southeast Asia all the time, you know. Uh, and of course, the key cornerstone will be the question of India, how much uh, India will follow uh, Western politics. And I would say uh, there is one law, political law, uh, that used to be true already for China, you know, when Kissinger managed uh, to bring China on the table against the Soviet Union. Uh, there was the saying that nobody really will be able to play the Chinese card except the Chinese themselves. And I think a similar rule will be also uh, true for India. Nobody really will be able to play the Indian card except India itself. Mm. Of course, uh, you cannot compare immediately and India will need quite some time uh, to have a similar performance as China and so on. Uh, but there is such a high uh, self-consciousness now to be the biggest nation of the world. Maybe at the end of the century have double the size of population as India, maybe being by far bigger than everybody else. And having this central geostrategic position uh, in the Indian Ocean and in the Indo-Pacific, the new hub of world politics. Uh, but this does not go only in, into one direction. Uh, maybe you have learned also in the last weeks, you know, that uh, Narendra Modi is changing the official name, Bharat, giving the country the genuine Indian name it had. So far, there is also a tendency of decolonization, of course, of uh, evolving its own strength and, and uh, cultural values and so on. And insofar, uh, one must not underestimate it. Of course, there is quite a movement, and I would say uh, India will play this mm -hmm. card. Of course, it will try to get most out of the interest from both sides. Uh, but, of course, uh, due to this antagonistic situation with China, you know, being a rival, not only as an immediate neighbor, but uh, feeling encircled by uh, Chinese geo strategies, uh, it probably will be at least at the security, in the security dimension, a clear, a clear partner uh, for the Americans, uh, at least as long as the Americans really will dominate uh, by its military. And in so far, <laughs> it will be the Navy and the Air Force, not so much the Army, mm. American, that, that will decide this question. <laughs> but moving also to the aspect of the European Union, and you have painted this picture uh, showing also the dynamic political leaders of the countries versus uh, not as dynamic leaders probably also in the European Union uh, with, with the leaders that you have shown also in your image and the argument for that. Wouldn't there also be the need, therefore, to engage from the European Union perspective more with India, more with the Global South as an uh, honest, uh, uh, not only economic, but also political alternative to probably uh, countries with in the BRICS plus format that have already a strong influence on the Global South? Yeah. Uh I have to say, you know, I never could understand how much Europe neglected India. Almost no relationship. It was left more or less uh, to UK, to the Britons. Uh, but if you look, you know, German initiatives, French initiatives and so on, they date just a few, a very short period, you know. They underestimated it completely. And the reason behind it is, of course, businessmen go to the place where they can make uh, the best business, you know. Uh, but 
you also can see, you know, that a political strategy behind it can help a lot. And there was no strategy. And what I have to say, even now, you know, Europe, of course, is by far too slow, is by far uh, too, I would not say too lazy, but just maybe uh, not able to mm. take the initiative, go outside, occupy itself. Although, especially Europe and India would be almost ideal partners from the structure and from different reasons. Thank you very much. Uh, Mario Holzner, I also have a, a question, a specific one for you. You were already mentioning in your conclusion that you still see a BRICS currency as an alternative for the US dollar as a fantasy or an illusion, because that would also have been one of my questions. But uh, going a little bit beyond uh, that, the increasing dependency that you have also mentioned when it comes to raw earth and metals uh, that is especially uh, uh, very strong in, 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 in the Chinese case, but also in other BRICS countries. How would you see that this increasing dependency will also evolve in the future, in especially um, the next couple of decades, where we already know that the production of green energy is playing an ever more important role? Uh, would you say that the leverage that BRICS countries, and especially therefore China have over the US, over Europe, might grow to a point where this would lead also to a potential political conflict that is derived from this economic or this, this, this uh, question of resources? Well, I, I hope not, obviously. I think also that the Chinese uh, leadership, at least at the moment, has, for instance, no interest in uh, the EU to disappear, things like that. I think they understand that we are uh, a market for them, maybe also a destination uh, for tourism. Maybe it's not the worst thing on earth to just become a, a place where old people live and that have nice scenery. I mean, could be um, the fate of Europe in any case. Um, but clearly, I mean, it's not only China, there are also a number of materials which, which where Russia will always re remain as long as Russia exists uh, as uh, the source country for, for various things. I mean, just speaking about every, a lot of uh, people are very enthusiastic about uh, going nuclear, but I mean, a lot of nuclear fuel comes from Russia as well. It's, it's, it's not only oil they have, it's the biggest uh, uh, country in terms of space, so they also have all kinds of uh, other very important uh, materials, and then so so do others have. There is still a lot of materials of, of importance, of high importance in in Africa. Uh, there is uh, uh, little to no strategy of Europe with regard to India, but there is also, in fact, little to no strategy or even uh, counterproductive strategies of, of uh, Europe, respectively, various uh, former colonial powers um, in Africa. With Africa, there is a lack of a partnership. Um, uh, engagement on, on, on a kind of at least some uh, uh, on, on a level playing field with uh, uh, trying to really uh, be friends of, of these countries even if some of these countries are obviously very difficult also in political terms um, and it goes on so I mean we will it's, it's not only the, 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 this sphere of, 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 of metals and, and what have you. If you look at the demographic situation, um, uh, the source of um, migration that goes to Western Europe, uh, which in the last decades was Eastern Europe, basically, <laughs> to a large extent, uh, that's over. Uh, the demographic situation in Eastern Europe is uh, uh, catastrophic. Um, some of these countries will see a decline in working age population over the next decades by 10, 20, even 30 percent. Um, we see parts of the region in, with uh, full employment, not because the economy is uh, growing like crazy, but because basically um, uh, the young people have left the region uh, over the last decades uh, and are just simply not there to, to have uh, families and so on. Um, 
what is the region with uh, which still will have uh, some population growth in in the vicinity of Europe? That's Northern Africa, the MENA region. Um, I don't see where we have uh, strategies where we say, okay, this time we maybe organize migration in a better way, uh, that it works better than in the past, that we have maybe schemes which not completely cannibalize the, the countries that are the source countries of the migrants, but maybe have, again, some kind of a partnership agreement with them, circular migration schemes, we discussed them for decades. Um, but then actually some of, 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 of uh, the governments, uh, the German government is quite active in this respect, uh, but uh, I fear our governments are uh, as well going into the Kosovo and mm -hmm. grabbing basically all uh, potential persons that could work in hospitals, you know, the leaving um, these countries without, uh, like also Romania, without doctors and so on. It's really a problematic situation. We should somehow find ways to, to deal with, with these issues as well. And so, unfortunately, it's not only raw earth, but uh, rare earth, but also rare, uh, rare humans uh, and, and, and many other issues. Um, so, yeah, it's complicated. Mm. And moving very briefly also to the economic situation in the global south, especially when it comes to economic development, do we here in, in the West have to agree with the fact that the BRICS are simply offering the better solution in terms of economic development, especially when it comes to uh, the Belt and Road Initiative by China, but also other initiatives by the BRIC countries? Why is there such a growing interest, also from an economic point of view, to close, more closely align with the BRICS countries in the Global South than uh, with, with Global North countries? I think it's quite a mixed picture. I mean, very heterogeneous group of countries. I mean, Argentina is not known for the, the most uh, um, uh, for brilliant economy, of, at least not in the last decades, uh, and others had problems too. But there are countries that had uh, high growth. Uh, uh, Ethiopia was such a country, which, however, ended up in a, in a catastrophic war, uh, which destroyed a lot of these um, uh, developments and achievements. Uh, China is just very different. It can um, run an economy which the others have very, almost can't do actually the same things. So China has, has a lot of, of power. It was able to uh, not being colonized in an economic way, but having basically um, joint ventures uh, firms in the beginning, uh, and they transferred in that sense, let's put it, say they transferred, uh, they were also, let's say, stealing a little bit or, or copying, let's put it that way, technologies, and, and, and now are actually surpassing the West in many uh, areas, and they have uh, um, uh, actually had a very pragmatic uh, ex uh, way to, to think about this uh, and also to think about issues in the longer term and they had no problems to apply uh, measures of let's say more traditional industrial policy and uh, while um, the European Commission was uh, still um, and, and also the World Bank and others were still uh, for a long time trying to defend their old positions of the Washington consensus that industrial policy is something bad. China was just doing it and now we are coming fairly late to the party and now we are trying to copy exactly the same things that the Chinese started to do uh, maybe a decade and a half uh, earlier and, and so that is something that is difficult for us to, to, to now uh, quickly try to, to copy these things and again here I also don't see where our strategic uh, geoeconomic ideas, um, where is our specific um, idea about um, about industrial policy or whatever mm -hmm. you call it. In any case, we see that the old paradigm of uh, efficiency is uh, to a large extent dead. I think now really everyone has understood that uh, there is a trade-off between efficiency and security and that we also have to think about security in various fields. It's uh, not only energy security, it's social security, it's uh, military security, it's uh, a whole lot, a whole list of, of security issues which we have to put into the equation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'd like to open the floor now to questions from the audience. We will collect a couple of questions. We have a microphone in the back. And I think uh, you, sir, in the, in the second row were the first. One, two, and then three. Alfred Braus, I'm president of the Ukrainian-Austrian Association. 
talking about the topic, uh, the new BRICS uh, consequences for the world order. I feel, and this is a little bit provocative, of course, uh, that uh, um, to deploy power, to create a real impact, you need cohesion, you need a deep strategic alliance. But this, in my view, is not possible if you take the membership of BRICS as such, and even more of BRICS Plus. It's China versus Russia, it's Sunnis uh, versus uh, Shiites, etc., etc., etc. There is no cohesion. So I would feel that it's not only a wishful thinking uh, that there would be a joint new currency, as you said, Mr. Holzer. Going beyond that, it's a, it's a wishful dreaming uh, to create a joint impact. Uh, it's uh, some countries, like China, maybe in future Brazil, and of course uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, etc. But it is not BRICS or BRICS Plus as such. Thank Please you. tell me if I'm right or wrong. <laughs> Second question. Thank you kindly. I'm Daniel Gomber, Sinology student at the University of Vienna. And my question, I have one economic and one geostrategic question. Very briefly, how do you assess the Chinese housing bubble? That's the economic question for Mr. Holzner. And the geostrategic question is, does India's self-assertion, newfound confidence, also pose problems for the West, as we have seen recently with Canada and the diplomatic problems there? Thank you. Thank you very much. Third question here in the third row. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, my name is Heinz Nissel. I'm a geographer interested in geopolitics. Uh, I will not talk about India. Thank you, Werner. Uh, I agree. Uh, Europeans should stop sleeping now. Uh, but what, what is this strange construction bricks? What was the idea behind it? It, it was from the origin, it was anti-American, anti-World Bank and anti-monetary uh, fund. This was the original idea because all those countries disliked the, the, the many hurdles they got from these institutions financially. So, uh, Russia was a world power, it was never a developing country. And now, BRICS plus, we see this foolish combination of Saudi Arabia and Iran. How is that possible? Now, just look at the war going on in Israel. Yeah? How is it possible that these two countries are combined in BRICS? This is my question, my main question. Uh, of course, the idea to, to create an, an anti-dollar currency, that's a very complicated question. But in the, in the long run, it is what, Werner, what you said, the global south. The global south is standing up against the so-called Western domination for 500 years. That's the story behind. Thank you. One fourth question before we go to a round of answers. My name is Günter Fellinger. I run an Austrian People's Petition for a free trade agreement between America and the European Union. Before we all get too negative, we still have 60% of the world output as OECD, and we are six times richer than the BRICS, so I think it's also good to see that perspective. To Professor Holzer, my question, the OECD, wouldn't it be the competing union? Why don't we enlarge the OECD much more actively? Why don't we promote the union of market democracy, which the OECD is, as an alternative to BRICS? And why is the obstacle that we are so slow that we have basically frozen the enlargement process of BRICS in 2016, of OECD in 2016? Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. We will have another round of questions afterwards. I'd like to just take those four questions first and ask Mr. Hartzner, probably because also the last question was addressed directly to you, probably to go first in, in answering the questions. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. So I, I, yeah, I start with the, with the last question. I mean, when I studied it, uh, that's, uh, that was in the mid-90s of the last century, um, 
uh, China had economically the size of Italy, and people were saying, look, this is far away. Yeah. I mean, you know, time passes by quite quickly. <laughs> I was just a kid some hours ago, I thought, but then, then things change. I mean, obviously, for China, it will become more and more difficult to actually further grow. But as we saw, India is a case in point. The sheer increase of population will make it also grow strongly. Again, per capita, you're absolutely right. These uh, countries uh, might never actually reach the levels of, of, of economic uh, development in, in, in a per capita sense and productivity, but, um, but, but the overall volume can, can grow very quickly. Why is the OECD not um, more than basically a collection of statistics on a website? Um, look, I mean, the European Union, with all its institutions, has troubles to actually coordinate policy. You know, it's and as it was mentioned, it's just very difficult for uh, different uh, states, uh, but even for for municipalities also to to cooperate. I mean, think about the. Uh, uh, the tunnel that should connect uh, uh, Germany with Italy uh, under the, the Brenner uh, and the Alps, you know. Surprisingly, Austria and Italy of all countries have finished their works and in Germany they haven't even started. So we can't even do this little thing across two border lines. So crossing um, these, these uh, borders between countries just very difficult to, to coordinate things. Um, there was the question, what, what really um, um, are the BRICS? Um, I, I, I like this, uh, this uh, story about that uh, I think one, one of the, the articles that Ivan Krastev wrote, uh, uh, um, I think about the middle powers, I, I'm sure you have read it, uh, he says uh, countries uh, want to be at the table and not uh, on the plate. And I think that's really the, the story. They, they, they want to share, uh, they want to f form the world a little bit as well. And, and so far we just didn't let them even sit at the same table and, and discuss things or just, uh, just very briefly. So I think it makes perfect sense for them to at least somehow try to show that they are interested in... in also uh, uh, changing their own fate and there are I think parallels to in a historical way to the to the non-alignment movement and I mean that gave countries like Yugoslavia uh, uh, possibilities far above their actual true um, uh, 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 power uh, to actually play a certain role in the world at least on a symbolic level. Um, the, and maybe this special question about the Chinese housing bubble but it's a uh, that, that is a, a problematic issue. Uh, I mean, it's not really crucial for China in the sense that uh, China has full control over its central bank. Uh, it's a government institution, so to speak. So in principle, they can, and given the huge amounts of US dollar reserves that they have, they can basically um, uh, bury in the, 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 the problematic uh, uh, loans that are, or the the the, the debt that uh, accumulates in the in the construction companies in, at any point in time in the in the balance sheet of the uh, People's uh, Bank of China, but the question really is why didn't they do that? Yeah. Um, so um, whoever was buying uh, Evergrande shares, the biggest uh, uh, Chinese construction company, like I did. Uh, that was a very bad idea. Uh, so you have lost 95%. Yeah? I thought this is not possible. This is an authoritarian state. I mean, they will never let their most important construction <laughs> company down. I mean, how crazy can you be? Yeah? So there must be some kind of political... Uh, there's obviously a change in the whole system in China, how uh, the party leadership is seeing uh, the, the, the private business sector. Um, and I mentioned it briefly, there is this problem of China actually intellectually understanding that they should change, change their com economic model from being the export Weltmeister uh, to uh, a model that is more centered around own creation of demand. 
Um, but if you do not even have a proper welfare state, you will not be able to create a constant stream of consumption in your country. Um, and uh, uh, Chinese have to invest into into uh, 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 flats, for instance, as a security for old age uh, uh, risks. And uh, investing into real estate is one of the most useless things on earth because you're actually um, maybe not even living in that flat. So there are flats, uh, a huge amount of flats which are not populated. Young people have troubles to actually uh, uh, have the money to buy a flat. Uh, uh, you get bubbles, overvaluation of, of prices of something that is, a th is seen as an investment asset and not as a, something to, to live in. So no rental market, no proper pension system that goes hand in hand. And, and here you are. And so China is experiencing similar things like uh, also the US and uh, the UK are regularly experiencing. 80% uh, of all financial crises uh, come, uh, stem from the from the real estate market. Uh, and, and that will just take very long time uh, going through all the balance sheets with all the problems that that includes. But in principle, it's nothing that China has a problem with. It, in principle, they could just uh, write it down and then put it into the, into the balance sheet of the central bank if they would like to. Mm -hmm. Mr. Faslam, do we have yeah. also a couple of questions for you? Probably we can align even that question and combine it, the question yeah, regarding yeah. Saudi Arabia and Iran and how that we can align in the BRICS and also if there is any coherence at all. Well, I think, uh, as already Mario also said, we, sh we should not uh, only think from the moment or from the past, but look into the future. I mean, uh, Europe itself is the best example for it, you know. Uh, famous uh, Germany, France, uh, constellation in the past and now uh, trying to be a team uh, that tries to lead Europe. So far, one should not underestimate also uh, the development. What I see is, of course, BRICS as such, okay, now this is a construction. Construction on the paper, nothing has happened. We don't even know yet whether Argentine will become a member, yes or no. But, you know, such constellations uh, can become decisive for the future. And if you look at the European situation, you have to say, okay, uh, Europe has changed completely and other regions too. And what I see is, of course, BRICS as such will not be capable to formulate a strategy. But what will happen? The same, at the same thing as at the Western side. The Western side is led by the Americans. Whether the Europeans are enthusiastic or less ent enthusiastic, they will follow. And the same will happen with Japan, with South Korea, with Australia and others. And okay, and China is trying, the other side, to establish a similar thing with China uh, as uh, the middle or the, the central power, let me, uh, and developing strategies, and of course, buying uh, uh, friends on the one hand and on the other hand, uh, having admirers, whatever, you know. This is not just one single uh, motivation behind it, and insofar, insofar one must not underestimate it. I do not think that you know, a multipolarity uh, will be a system uh, for the future. You can forget it. You have two big poles. This is Washington, this is Beijing, and maybe in the future, India will be able to develop a sort of a third pole, uh, especially for the global south. But everything else, Russia will not play a role, and also Europe will not be able to play a real role due to the fact that America is so dominant and there's no leadership uh, in Europe. And uh, insofar you have to look at this possible development. And uh, 
what is happening, you know, by sitting together. And I think this was a Chinese masterpiece, a diplomatic masterpiece now, uh, this extension of, uh, of the BRICS. Why? I mean, G7 is a group, you know, uh, that where you really can discuss. Seven pe people or eight or nine sitting on a table. G20, of course, it's all already an assembly. Somebody gives the directions and the other are more or less listening. And uh, in group dynamics, you know, uh, if you go back, this is around about the number of a dozen uh, where people will uh, be able to be activated as, uh, as a group, you know, the, the single members. And just limiting it now to 11 or maybe 10 members certainly is a fact where they also offer a playing ground for MBS and MBZ, <laughs> uh, for others. One should not underestimate people who never have played uh, a big role in global politics and now suddenly have the, uh, the feeling and the impression they can play a role uh, and uh, others will listen to them and they can make history by uh, different things. Okay, one must not underestimate. This was the reason why I also tried to show the people because one must not underestimate the influence mm -hmm. of personalities into global politics, regional politics. Uh, okay, this is the mm -hmm. most important thing uh, that I see. Yeah. Let's go to the second round of questions. And I know that we have some in the first row here. Exactly. And then the second row. Good evening. Uh, my name is Nina Elseniuk. I'm an IP scholar from Bratislava University of Economic and Management. I am researching BRICS for the last 10 years, uh, and um, I have uh, two questions for you. Uh, starting in 2001, we, uh, we enter uh, this uh, historical period with a, a paper of Jim O'Neill, uh, Building Better Global Economic uh, uh, BRIC, uh, where he mentioned GDP growth of BRIC countries, and he predicted that for the next 10 years, uh, BRICS countries uh, will raise its share in the uh, global economic. Uh, then in uh, 2009, uh, in uh, June 2009, it was f uh, first uh, formal BRICS summit, followed by 2011, Chinese participation in Sanya summit. And then in 2014, we saw uh, creation of uh, bank uh, BRICS, BRICS Bank, and then 2015, BRICS uh, contingent reserve arrangement, right? So it was shifting from the very beginning from economic perspective till po political perspective and so on. So nowadays, what do you think? Uh, BRICS plus expansion, is it geostrategic or geoeconomic? This is the first question. And then uh, who is the main beneficiary uh, of this BRICS plus uh, group? Thank you. Thank you very much. In the second row as well. Uh, my name is Pete Baum. I study here. Uh, my question is because I saw some slides for the import-export, um, China and US dollar. You just mentioned the three trillion dollar dollar reserves. There is a century of China versus US. I want to know what you think about the potential, the geopolitical strategic potential of those reserves. Mm -hmm. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Yes, one question over here, and yeah, one here directly. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you. Uh, I want to ask, uh, seeing the picture of uh, leaders from the BRICS, for example, that are very dynamic and, and have a vision and the idea where they want to go, uh, and uh, constant contrasting this to, to basically Western leaders, I want to ask uh, what, in your opinion, uh, would be visions that if Western leaders had them, they would actually get us where we should go? Because I, I'm just thinking about uh, what visions we would need and, and would need to, to follow uh, to, to get to a better future in which uh, things look better for everyone, probably. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. And last question all the way here to my right. Uh, 
Yes, maybe uh, let's turn to, uh, in, in the long run. When uh, John Maynard Keynes was asked, what does this mean in the long run? His answer was, in the long run, we're all dead. And that's what I, uh, comes to my mind when I see this, uh, the, the old people running the world, uh, the Western world, and bricks. Uh, that, that is one thing, but, uh, but thinking of living, uh, living people and getting fewer and fewer of them, I think of China. Uh, China uh, at now 1.3 uh, billion people, and as the uh, demographics told us, uh, they will be down to 700 million in a couple of decades. How will this affect not only the world order, but how will this af affect uh, BRICS? And now, of course, China is the, is, is, is the, ma is the main country, but being half or a third of the population of, of India, uh, how will this affect the whole group? Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Do we want to start now, Dr. Faslam, with, yeah. with you? Okay. Uh, yeah, I do not think that you really can separate geostrategic and geoeconomic uh, perspectives, you know. They are very close. I just want uh, to take our two presentations, you know. Uh, we developed them without knowing what the other side would present, okay. So I had, uh, we had two, uh, two slides, just the same slides, you know, on the one hand, and of course, uh, also, uh, I don't know, Mario Holzner ended with uh, India uh, and, and China antagonistic states, you know. Uh, therefore, this and that will happen. So far, I am convinced you cannot really uh, separate it, especially also from the Chinese side, as I said, you know, Xi Jinping's uh, theory uh, is founded on economic growth. Uh, the whole Chinese system, of course, is very much based on geoeconomics, and insofar one uh, must not underestimate it. On the other hand, what can we learn out of it? Mario Hotzner said uh, one thing about American exports that I try uh, almost like a preacher, you know, uh, to talk about in Europe. This is 60% of American exports go to America. They go to Mexico and to Canada because neighborhood, neighborhood is one of the most decisive factors for uh, economic development. As I usually say, everybody can go cross-border, but only big companies can go overseas. And this means, you know, that you have to look at it. And when I look what is happening, and you mentioned it too, you know, in Africa, this is the counter rim of Europe, Northern Africa. And if you look to our relationship to, to African countries, that we are not capable to learn that our system of development is for nothing. It's sometimes even counterproductive, not uh, a, a real contribution for development, but just helping, you know, to uh, perpetuate uh, social specific uh, social uh, structures and so on. So far, we have to learn out of it. That's what I see. And what we can do is, of course, uh, I mean, people come and go. And the Western big advantage is that already, uh, probably after four years, but for sure after eight years, you will have a completely different team uh, leading also our nations. And the new leaders are coming out of a competition, also personal and party competition. And insofar, uh, this contest is a good basis also for developing new ideas. That's what I see. Mm. For Europe, of course, it's too much dependency on the, uh, what is coming from Washington, too, 
too little uh, activity by its own, because if the Americans do not care for, Euro for Africa, at least the Europeans should do it, must do it, because this is our neighborhood. It's not a priority for America, but for sure, highest priority for Europe. That's what I see. Thank you. I think that's a very precise vision and also ambition that especially European leaders can definitely follow up, up, up upon in the future. Mario Hartzner, you have the last word. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so the question, yeah, BRICS plus geostrategic versus geoeconomic, yeah, difficult to disentangle. Um, who is the main winner? Well, I think you also showed it with the with the um, uh, with trading routes uh, where China clearly has this problem that they want to be less dependent on on uh, the the Malacca Strait uh, and have different uh, other trading routes and in this system of new friends, so to speak, uh, they they try also to, to buy up harbors and so on. I mean, it's all related to to their more general strategy. So I guess they in a way are the main winner and maybe uh, the one or the other smaller country that all of a sudden is also um, a part of, of, a, of, a, of a new club. Um, Chinese reserves uh, in US dollar and what is the geostrategic dimension of it? Well, yeah, in principle one could do all kinds of, of, of crazy things with it, but um, yeah, the question is how, 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 how much you can really do. So Russia really learned uh, it the hard way that all of a sudden, hundreds of billions are away. Um, it's difficult, yeah. So, um, in the end, if you bo have been buying a U.S. Treasury bill, you basically got a piece of paper with an eagle on it, yeah. And and in and for that, you have been working quite hard and 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 producing all kinds of computers and what have you, yeah. So um, again, it's it's a it's 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 it goes both ways. It's it's a difficult thing. Um, what could be uh, the visions um, um, for for Western leaders? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, for Europe at least. Um, well, we, 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 in in addition to what Werner Fasslamt has been saying already, I can mention that we have done for the Bertelsmann Stiftung uh, a study on um, geoeconomic interconnectivity between the EU and basically its neighbors uh, in comparison with uh, the US, uh, with China and Russia. And um, um, we analyzed more than 60 indicators. And the EU in basically is still the main, uh, 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 the main uh, um, partner for uh, our neighborhood. Yeah. There are a few things where things go in the wrong direction. So, for instance, uh, the country's imports of high technology goods. So, there, uh, China has been increasing its shares in, 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 in the imports of these countries uh, in, in, in terms of high technology. And this reflects our own European incapability of uh, forming a high tech sector. We have been sleeping. Um, um, and, and not really developing uh, a, a high-tech sector which can compete uh, on the markets properly. Um, maybe we can change this. This would be a vision, however, probably to fairly difficult sell to the electorate. So what else could be done? Uh, I think people expect a credible energy transition. I think most people understand that this is something that has to come anyway. but. They also understand that the political elites are obviously incapable of organizing properly that, uh, that transition. I mean, not only the German government, but they are certainly um, uh, have been completely misunderstanding this whole uh, process. Uh, and even in, in, I think, in February, March of last year, uh, European leaders should have immediately started with a program of uh, constructing um, uh, high voltage uh, uh, electricity cables throughout uh, Europe from north to south to connect the potentials of uh, wind farms in the north with solar power in the south and the, uh, hydro in the center and the big industrial consumers of electricity also in the center. Why haven't they been doing this? Mm. By now we could have already probably done half of the job if we would uh, have uh, really uh, pressed for this. I think this is the kind of leadership that 
uh, broad parts of the population would expect uh, um, European leaders to, to, to decide in Brussels. We have the, the formats, we have the meeting places to do that actually uh, with special um, agreements on, on, on how to do this. And this goes on, uh, like uh, you mentioned, we uh, have uh, this uh, blue sky idea of a European Silk Road with a, at the core uh, a high-speed rail network throughout Europe. I mean, you could reduce huge amounts of CO2, you could provide uh, uh, high-quality um, transport among the big cities in Europe. Uh, 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 you don't let the German uh, Bahn do this thing, but maybe the Swiss <laughs> or the, uh, the Italians actually have the, the, the best uh, railway uh, company uh, in, in, in Europe uh, these days in terms of uh, quality of, of rail transport. So, in any case, you know, I mean, there would be, I think, an, a number of, of good things uh, where leaders could, could show their leadership. Uh, and finally, well, this John Maynard Keynes quote was also related to the question, in the long run, we are all dead, related to certain ideas of, uh, I'm paraphrasing it, of uh, the idea of, uh, of balanced equilibrium states, you know, in economic theory, which in reality never are there to approach. The world is constantly in this equilibrium and we see just now, I mean, what happened in, in Israel recently, what, uh, I mean, it happens all the time in Ukraine, there is, the world is not in equilibrium, it's, it's a constant disequilibrium and, and we, are, we should try to not be running too far behind the curve to, to deal with all these issues. Ideally, we would have a plan beforehand. Uh, when things happen, how to immediately react to that. And um, uh, the very last issue on the fall of Chinese population. Well, in, in a way, you could say this is also the actual final result of the one-child policy. I mean, this is what China wanted, in a way, to achieve. And uh, you can raise GDP per capita in two ways. You can, on the one hand, increase the GDP. But you can also reduce the capital, basically. <laughs> and uh, that's maybe not the worst way how to reduce capitals. There, there have been other ways that uh, were far more um, 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 yeah, disgusting. So this is maybe not, not the best, uh, not the worst uh, situation that China is in. Obviously, uh, f such a sharp fall in population in a fairly short period of time, such an aging of population brings with it a lot of political problems and, and practical problems, but nevertheless, I mean, if a country probably can solve it, then probably China somehow has some ideas about it, but let's see. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much to our both excellent speakers, Mario Holzner and Werner Fasselabend, for their excellent uh, remarks, and also special thanks to you, the audience, for joining us tonight for your very interesting and relevant questions. We hope that we can welcome you soon again at one of our future discussions, and I'd like to wish you a wonderful rest of the evening, and please join me in giving a big round of applause again to our speakers.